across the fence from the grill to the greens. We'll visit with farmers from Shelburne who found a way to grow their business in the cold of winter and the warmth of summer. Whatever the season, it's always delicious. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. We talk a lot about food on Across the Fence because, well, why wouldn't we? We're blessed with having farmers and food entrepreneurs who want to provide fresh local products for all. But it's also important to make sure that the consumer understands where their food comes from and what it takes to make the meal. And our guests today have found a unique way to make their bread and butter by bringing the plate to the farm. I'm joined today by Adam Wilson and Corey Pierce, co-owners of Bread and Butter Farm in Shelburne. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Adam, maybe you can talk a little bit about how Bread and Butter Farm got started. Um, so the, we were able to purchase the farm because of the hard work of the land trust that conserved the property in, um, in conjunction with the Leduc family. Mm -hmm. And Corey and I applied to purchase the farm in 2009 and were chosen and had the unique opportunity to buy this 143-acre property seven miles from downtown Burlington. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you decided to become a farmer. Um, so I started working on a 20-acre vegetable farm where I grew up in southern New Hampshire. And um, I was a teenager and just immediately fell in love with the work. I fell in love with the actual physical being outdoors work. Um, I fell in love with <clears throat> just working as a team and also knowing that the, the family that owned the farm, it was their place and they were contributing to their community and I, that really struck me deeply as a kid and I continued working there all, all through high school and college and then as an adult just tried to figure out, not coming from a family farm, trying mm -hmm. to figure out how, how to do that, how to like get that started <laughs> without having the land. What advice do you have for people who are sort of in the same boat? I mean, I guess that's really the key is you have to have the desire, but then you have to have the farm. Right. Yeah, it's a big challenge. Um, access to land is a big challenge. As Adam said, the Land Trust um, is doing a lot to help farmers get on the land at a reasonable, in a, in a reasonable way um, from a cost perspective. Um, but yeah, persistence, gaining experience, working on different farms. Um, both Adam and I met at Santa Cruz, uh, the University of California does a farmer training program now like UVM's farmer training program. So mm -hmm. there are educational opportunities to, to train to be farmers. So I think a collective effort of all of those things. And how did you decide on Vermont? I had uh, gone to college in at Dartmouth. So mm -hmm. I was and I had lived in Vermont for part of that time and spent time up here. And um, I was drawn to Vermont because of the uh, supportive community of farmers and interested and supportive customers. It felt like, a, um, felt like a place to start a farm that felt just a little bit easier than maybe other places in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, my, par my grandparents lived in Vermont, so being from New Hampshire, we spent a lot of time here. Mm -hmm. So same thing, I, lo I loved Vermont. And when Adam and I met and started talking about possibility of being business partners, we um, Vermont was kind of our dream, and we didn't know if that would come to fruition, but um, it did. <laughs> well, a one way bread and butter farm has carved out a niche is to start growing crops um, when most other farmers are bringing in the harvest. Across the Fence associate producer Keith Silva shows us bread and butter's passive approach to farming. When the snow starts to fly at Bread and Butter Farm in Shelburne, it's a sign it's time to pitch. The niche really for us is the winter growing and, and focusing on cold hardy winter greens. Corey Pierce and her business partner, Adam Wilson, run this 140 acre farm. In addition to what they grow in their two greenhouses, they have beef cattle and operate a bakery. On Fridays during the summer, they host burger nights. From buns to burgers to salads, all of the food is made and served on site. During the winter months, Pierce harvests kale and spinach. As for the rest of the management in the greenhouse, she makes sure to keep everything fairly passive. The only thing that we're capturing here is the sun's heat, and we call it passive solar greenhouses. Because of the, the volume of space that we have in here and, and the plastic relatively tight space that we've got, it stays warm in here. The soil actually stays about 40 degrees, um, and we get, you know, on a sunny day in January when it's 12 degrees outside, we'll get up to 70 degrees in here, 80 degrees um, when, it, when things really get heat, heated up. 
Um, and we actually on those days, continuous sunny days in a row, we'll actually get growth, especially in the spinach and a little bit in the kale. Um, but yeah, I, I, the way I look at it is the input that's gone into this is the, the steel and the plastic in the frame, and that's a long-term investment. Um, but then after that, it's just a matter of managing the space. And, and actually, people always think it's all about like getting the plants, keeping them as warm as possible. It's actually more about making sure that we actually are minimizing the, the, the temperature swing that they are experiencing. So I'm actually doing a lot of venting and a lot of clearing out of the warm air. Pierce tries to keep the temperature in the greenhouse at about 60 degrees. When it gets really cold, like at night, she covers the plants with a row cover. Think of it like using a blanket to tuck the plants in. The row cover creates a microclimate, which keeps the temperature 20 degrees warmer than the air outside. People, I think, like once they come in and see like no additional heat except the sun, and they can see crops actually alive. Um, they can taste them, and they they have a totally different taste from kale in the summer. It might not look as pretty this time of year, but it's tastier than ever and tender and sweet and all that. And same thing with the spinach. Um, people get really excited. I think people are really getting used to it. Like people are even on their own and little cold frames outside are starting to 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 try to overwinter more and that's great. I think I think it's totally doable and these plants are totally amazing how they <laughs> how they survive. Pierce sells what she grows through her farm and through Healthy Living, a natural foods market in Burlington. As consumer demand for local food continues to increase even in the winter, farmers are sure to fill the need. University of Vermont vegetable and berry specialist Fern Grubinger believes winter hardy crops could help farmers stand out in a crowded marketplace. Uh, but it's not something that every grower is interested in because people are pretty busy throughout the growing season, which is long as it is. So uh, it takes a certain kind of grower that wants to be uh, dealing with the, the tunnels and the covers and keeping these crops alive and harvesting them in the middle of winter. But a lot more growers could be doing this. It's not um, an exclusive kind of technology. It's, it's affordable and attainable by a lot of people. It just has to fit their uh, production season and their personal you know, schedule of growing. We're starting to see more growers producing crops, leafy greens, cold hardy greens in the winter, in part because there's an unmet market demand, um, whereas in many locations, summer vegetables are pretty saturated because there are a lot of growers and a lot of farmers markets and things like that. So I expect to see more uh, winter production in the coming years. Increased competition is one problem Pierce would be happy to have. I just want to see people do this. Like I'm not, I don't look at it as like competition, you know. I think, I think a lot of factors are at play in our community and our state of like, and region of just like fostering this food system. And I think there's, I think there's a lot more space than some people might say. Honestly, I got really inspired when I saw the simplicity of the system. Like. I don't have to be managing propane tanks or whatever other heating source or, or fans or electricity coming into here or like I can just put these greenhouses up and boom, get going. And what I'm losing in yield by not putting in all that input to, to pump out the product, I am gaining in simplicity in not spending that money or, or those fossil fuel you know, inputs. You know, I think you gotta continually be creative with it. You can't sit back and just be like, oh, we figured out what we're doing, that's what we're gonna do. It's like, I feel like you have to constantly adapt. Spinach and kale, winter greens that taste good and keep farmers in the green all winter long. In Shelburne, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. If you're just joining us, I'm talking with Adam Wilson and Corey Pierce, co-owners of Bread and Butter Farm in Shelburne. And Corey, you just mentioned that you'd like to see more farmers do this. Yeah. Um, Definitely, there's plenty, plenty of room in the market for this. Um, the, the kale, the spinach, we grow some cilantro, some scallions. That's, we're, we're still barely servicing healthy living in a few crops mm -hmm. all in the winter. So there's so much more need. There's, they're still buying in a lot of greens from California and other places. Now, we've talked about burger night a little bit in the piece. Let's delve into that a little bit more. Um, tell me how that all started. Burger Night um, sort of came out of uh, our 
interest in figuring out how to take care of the land that we that we purchased or sort of inherited from the, the Ladukes in a mm -hmm. way. And um, with such a large acreage, it was more than we were going to use for our small herd of dairy cows. And our first year, we cut hay and had all this hay. And rather than trying to sell the hay, we decided to buy in some steers to feed the hay to to raise up as grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. And um, as a way to start marketing uh, beef to sort of get that part of the operation going, mm -hmm. we um, decided to grill some burgers on Friday afternoon. And our first burger night, we had maybe 150 people show up. So there was cl clearly a lot of interest um, yeah. in the event. So you're actually marketing your beef by just having hosting people to come and try it out. Yep. Yeah, it, um, part of our mission of our farm too, obviously we do a lot of different things. Um, but again, with the proximity to Burlington and Shelburne and South Burlington and all these towns, we were always talking about bringing people to the farm. And there's obviously this huge interest in local and farmers markets and CSAs, but we had this unique opportunity to actually have people come and see it all happen. And so then burger night, like he said, 150 people showed up to the first one and we were like, whoa, this is something. And then 50 more people came the next week and so on. And um, it really helped bring together our whole mission of having a community farm and a community event. And um, my partner Chris is a musician, so it made a lot of sense to bring in some live music and make it a really festive event. And um, something that we were talking about on the way here is how many people comment to us about the food, they love the food, but that really what people talk about is that they thank us for hosting an event for the community to come and gather at and for people to bring out of town guests and family and, and meet up with their friends locally. And that's been really, really special feedback to hear continuously from our, from our customers. Well, it sounds like people have really embraced the farm and kind of made it their own. I think when you're when you when you're there and you can interact, it yeah, it helps. It really helps to make it your own. And then we have people come shop. We're open on Fridays and Saturdays, so then people come to the farm store and they kind of can walk around a little bit and know what they're looking at. And I think that that's really exciting for people. And so now, what year is this for the the burger nights? How many years have you been yeah, doing we're this? Yeah, this is our fourth summer that we're starting up, yeah. And, and how many people are you going to expect now the, in these burger nights? We, um, we expect between four to 600 people every week on a nice sunny day. We, we have a lot of people come. <laughs> is that problematic, though? I mean, it seems like it's so successful that now, you know, that's going to, I would imagine, takes a little bit more work to kind of accommodate such a big event. It definitely, you know, we've needed to prioritize it as a whole section of our overall farm operation and op what we're doing. Um, we've had to definitely a lot of things to, f to learn about and um, health codes and licenses and mm -hmm. staffing and all of that. Um, but I think we've gotten our systems pretty down and yeah, we take we take the safety mm -hmm. of everybody there really seriously and making sure that everybody has a good time and enjoyable time and, and figuring out the marketing. like. Obviously, a, a bigger por portion of our food that we're producing, the beef, the vegetables that we're growing, the buns that Adam's making in the bakery, it's like it's a carving out a bigger mm -hmm. portion of our mm -hmm. overall farm production. And so this is, wouldn't be a model that any farm could adapt to, obviously. Well, I'd say um, we, everything that we do is a constant. We're constantly figuring out how mm -hmm. it goes, you know? And so I'd say, Farms do that all the time, no matter what their markets are. And, and I see farms constantly making adjustments and changes and, and trying new things. So I'd say, yeah, you just had to decide, if, is this something that you're interested mm -hmm. in doing and is going to work with your interests and skill sets? And, and you figure it out if it, if it does and if you like it. And I think a lot of farms do that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next for Bread and Butter Farm? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, well, it's a we're pretty excited to stay to do the same thing twice. <laughs> um, every year we've grown. So we've, we're hitting our fifth year actually this fall. So that's a big deal, um, and we've made a lot of big changes as we've grown. So we're just continuing to try to um, do what we do better and more refined, and take care of our land base even better. Take care of our animals well. Um, take care of ourselves well. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots of lots of ideas, um, but we're trying to 
trying to just do everything a little better. <laughs> Excellent. Well, to find out more about Burger Night at Bread and Butter Farm or visit their bakery and farm stand, you can visit their website, breadandbutterfarm.com, or give them a call at 802-985-9200. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.